Well, good morning, everybody. I'm back in the garden once again. A few things that I want to show you. They're progressing quite nicely. Uh, it's getting close to the end of our growing season here. Probably five or six weeks away from the first frost. But when you get to the end of August here, a lot of things in the garden begin to decline, even though there hasn't been any frost. I always think it has something to do with the shortening of the days. A lot of the squash leaves and that sort of thing start to die back. Anyway, I have two or three things I'd like to show you. And then I want to take you up to the house and show you a new set of things that I got called mason tops. Um, that allow you to do lacto-fermenting with vegetables um, in smaller quantities. In the past I've done it in a gallon jar. But this allows you to use wide mouth mason jars, um, quart size or even smaller if you wanted to. So I plan to start something with that today. Let's have a look around and see a few things in the garden first. Well, if you're watching Diane, Diane Murphy, this is my very first female blossom on the Tahitian squash. And for those who aren't aware, Tahitian is a very large uh, variety of the butternut squash. Uh, this is on the end of a, a long trailing vine. There are many blossoms behind it that haven't opened yet, but it's the only female that I see on the vine. And I have stopped the vine from growing. You might be able to see where I cut it just beyond this flower because I don't want it to uh, waste its time growing more vine. I want it to try to grow that squash as large as possible before frost hits and kills the vine and just so happened the same day there was a male Tahitian in bloom on the same length of vine here and I've removed the petals but I'm going to hand pollinate just in case the bees don't find it. I guess as I've said before I hand pollinate most of my squash. I check every day if I find female blossoms I go get a male flower and hand pollinate so we don't have to rely on the bees. They, sometimes they miss out. But it looks like I'm going to get a Tahitian and I hope it gets to grow to full size. Well I just got brave enough and picked another ear of corn. This time uh, they're just showing yellow there now I've taken the brown off but all of the silks were brown on this one. So it's looking like corn. Yes, very good. Not a large ear. Out towards the end, I don't know if that would have, if I left it longer, I guess those probably would have grown and developed too. But that's what it's supposed to look like. It's a bicolored corn, yellow and white. I still think maybe I'm a little too early if I'd left it longer. I think the yellow might get darker. However, I'm going to at least have that one ear with dinner this evening and we'll see what the what the flavor is like. I'm thinking I'm going to like this. Um, in years past, uh, with sweet corn, I always told you to have the water boiling when you picked it, but with this bicolor stuff, and it's an F1 hybrid, it isn't really necessary. It's been bred to stay sweet, and that's why you see mostly this in, in grocery stores if you're buying corn at a grocery store, because it ships well and, and stays sweet. So. We'll be trying that with dinner. I'm getting more ripe tomatoes every day, which is wonderful, but they're getting to the point where I can't keep up with eating them as just fresh fruit, so it won't be long and I'll have to, I don't know, cook some tomato sauce and can it or something. But what I wanted to speak about here right now is that system that I used for supports, the little clips, and I'm using 40 pound test fishing line to use the clips on. I had a feeling it would work really well and it has been fantastic. Um, these two that you're looking at are both Gardener's Delight, I guess. I'll show you some ripe fruit down below on them in a minute. But they've gone right to the roof in here and that's a good six feet off the ground. And the plant is being supported beautifully with just a few of those clips. So that is something that I'm glad I invested in. It wasn't very expensive, but it's working very well. This is looking down at some of the sun gold and they look kind of sporadic on the vine mainly because every time I'm in here when I see ripe ones I pick them and eat them. 
So they're here, there, and everywhere. There are bare patches where I've already picked. I'm going to harvest the rest of those before I leave here today because they're really ripe. I don't want them to spoil on the vine. Never grown sun golds before. I have a friend who says they're her favorite tomato because they're so sweet, and they are. They're as sweet as candy. They're delicious and a lot of nice tomato flavor. Very small in size, but they make up for that in flavor. These are Roma, and they're just starting to ripen. They're a determinate variety. It seems to me the last time I grew them they were larger than this, but maybe I'm wrong. They're not terribly large. Get a hand in there to show you. They're relatively small. But they're just starting to ripen because I say it's a determinate variety, and on my determinants I didn't do any pruning. So there are branches everywhere, produced lots of, of fruit, but there's also some yellowing in the leaves and things now, so I think they're starting to die back and they will now ripen their fruit. These are the Black Vernissage, the free seed that I got with an order that I placed with uh, Baker Creek, which uh, are all heirloom and uh, open pollinated varieties. On that lower cluster, I've taken a couple off and eaten them, and so far I'm not very impressed. I don't know, maybe they weren't completely ripe. They still have green stripes on them when they are ripe, so... I'm leaving the ones down there for a bit longer to see if I like it better when they get ripe. But they didn't have a lot of what I would call a tomato flavor. And like I say, maybe it wasn't ripe, but I didn't care for the flavor very much. So I don't think anyway right now that it's a variety that I would grow again. That's a couple of trusses of Gardener's Delight that you're looking at there. I have picked a couple off of the... Uh, top one or bottom truss, I'm not really sure now. And I love Gardener's Delight. They're a, I don't know, they're not a cherry tomato, they're larger than a cherry tomato. I guess what they call a saladette, a salad tomato. Not terribly large, and they grow those lovely long trusses of, of tomatoes. And it's an indeterminate, so that's the vines that I was showing you a little while ago that have gone right to the roof. But a very nice tomato, and one that I certainly would grow again. This variety is called Defiant, and it's a good-sized tomato. Not as large as some of the beefsteak things, but it's a good-sized tomato. That, one, that green one there is a handful. So just starting to ripen, but it's also one of the determinant varieties that I didn't do any pruning on, so I expected them to be a, a little late with the ripening. I only have one more variety, and it doesn't have anything ripe on it yet. It's what they call a parthenocarpic variety, supposedly doesn't need any pollination to produce fruit. It's got quite a bit of fruit. Slits or something like that, if I can think of it, I will put the name on the screen here. But uh, no sense in showing it to you, it's just green tomatoes at this point. This is for Chris on the Home Journal channel. I think that's the name of your channel, Chris. I always get these names confused. You gave me the seed and said they were a small melon. Well, I suspect they're not supposed to be this small. That's the largest one that I can find so far in here. And it's not yet tennis ball size. Get a hand in there to see. It's a cute little fuzzy thing. I'm hoping it continues to grow and ripen so I'll get a chance to taste them anyway. This is the Japanese black futsu squash, which I've never grown before and didn't know what to expect. Before I get this video finished processing, I will see if I can't check online to see what the size is supposed to be. There are numerous of them here on four plants. They're producing really nicely. Right next to that is one that's just bloomed this morning, a female blossom that I've pollinated. This was the first one that I ever found, and it's, I would say it's probably finished its growing. It's getting a very dark green. Um, probably even smaller. I was going to say it's the size of an acorn squash, but probably even smaller, but one serving size or two serving size. Um, I must check. Anyway, I'll put something on the screen to let you know if it's just what I'm doing with them or if they're supposed to be a small squash like that. This is the last of my cauliflower. It's not very large, but I'm going to harvest it. Uh, for some reason, this particular plant isn't growing the leaves that would normally cover the cauliflower like that to protect it from the sun, so it's already starting to yellow a bit and I don't want to lose it. So the last cauliflower of the season, and I'll give those leaves to the hens, they love them. All of the large heads of broccoli have been harvested and now I'm starting to get quite a few of these nice 
side shoots, which are also fair size heads. I mean, there's three heads there that you put them all together and you have a decent sized head of broccoli, I guess. I might have said cauliflower a minute ago. I have a one track mind. Quite a number of the plants that are like this, uh, maybe one or two more that are this size, and I will pick them today. I only have four Brussels sprout plants growing in amongst my wonderful turnips, rutabagas, swedes, whatever you call them. I'm going to pull one of those in a minute, first harvest of one of those. But at this time of year here, I cut the, the center growth out of the top of the Brussels sprout. And that signals to the plant that all of these tiny little sprouts that are at each leaf axle, it's time to develop them because it's not going to grow any taller. Um, the plants will be quite safe even after we've had two or three hard frosts, so they'll continue to grow well into October. But if I didn't do that, I wouldn't get anything of any size. So hopefully that means they will start beefing up really soon. As I've said many times before, turnips are much better if you harvest them after there's been heavy frost. But curiosity has got the best of me. I've got to try one of these. I've just picked this one randomly because it's one that's easier to get a camera angle on. I don't necessarily, this isn't necessarily the largest one here. But they're all, in my opinion anyway, a good size. I've never had such good luck with them before. Here that I guess I could eat, or the hen could eat. A lot of roots on it. I'll get that cleaned up and show you what it looks like in a few minutes here. Not a bad little harvest, I guess. The turnip is a bit misshapen. I've got it in there. I can't take it out now because all the other things will fall down. It'll crush it when I put it back. But it's sort of flat on one side and grew quite a few strange large roots. I don't know if that's the same idea as that carrots with too much compost will do that because it was a richly composted soil. I did that on purpose, put in a lot of chicken manure last fall. Wanted something really rich to try growing them in and it worked. I got good sized turnip, can hardly wait to see what it tastes like. I picked a number of small patty pans and this one here, the largest, or the only one I guess that I've seen of that particular variety, so I am getting all of the varieties now. The small ones I think will go in the fermented lacto-fermented vegetables that I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. Um, this I think is an Aleppo chili. I think I got three of those. One of those will go in the things, the vegetables too. Some of the mini yellow peppers, a sweet pepper. A couple of cucumbers. Um, a lot of people after I put out my dill pickle video, came out last night I guess, today is the 23rd, um, wanted me to do bread and butter pickles, which I also happen to like very much. So if I can get enough cucumbers saved up, I'll do a batch of bread and butter pickles. They can be a bit larger than the uh, ones for dill because you, you slice them into discs. So that size are a bit larger and I should, well, in a week or so I guess, I should have enough accumulated that I'll be able to try that batch of bread and butter pickles. Well, that's the harvest. Let's go to the house and do some lacto-fermented vegetables, or at least get them started. What I've decided, decided to start is a fermented jardineria, basically just mixed vegetables. I'm using most of the ones that were suggested in the recipe book that came with this kit, and uh, substituting some, and I'm doing a smaller batch. Uh, they had a half gallon, two quarts. I'm going to do one 750 milliliter jar, just because I ran out of quart jars, I guess. But this is the kit. I'll show you what's inside of it. Commonly available. I think I got mine on Amazon. This thing here, if I can get it out of there, is to pack things down in the jars. I uh, don't know as I will use it, well I might use it a bit with this particular recipe, but it would be good to have for making uh, sauerkraut. You could pack it down nicely in the jar and get more in the jar. And these things they call pickle pebbles. Pieces of glass. 
that fit down inside of a wide mouth mason jar and will hold the uh, vegetables that you're trying to pickle down below the brine so that they won't spoil. And this, they are in there very tightly. These are the things that you use in place of the lid on the mason jar, like the normal ring lid that would go on the mason jar, you use this. And the, uh, there's an opening there if you can see it or not. Gases will escape through that as the fermentation takes place. So I haven't washed this yet or the pebbles, so I'll come back and put this together for you once I've got this washed and the I guess I have the vegetables already assembled here, so I'll be right back. Well, I guess I'm ready to start. It says a cl one clove of garlic, a bay leaf, and I just picked that bay leaf off of my tiny bay tree in the living room. It doesn't say anything about dill, but I'm adding a little bit of my fresh dill. Now, uh, you can add a chili pepper, and this is one of the Aleppo chili peppers, very hot. It suggests that you cut the bottom and the top off of it, uh, leave it whole. The idea being that the brine will be able to get inside where the, most of the heat is in the filament and in the seeds. And other than that, I'm adding baby carrots. Those are boughten, and as we all know, they're not really baby carrots. Large carrots that have been whittled down to look like baby carrots, I guess. Cauliflower that I just picked today. Some broccoli. Some of the tiny little scallopini squash. And uh, the yellow, mini yellow peppers. I'm doing the same thing there. I'm cutting the stem end off. Some miniature cucumbers. Cut the blossom end off once again because it won't let things stay crisp. But just for the looks of it, I think I'll leave the stem end on. Keep going until I have the jar relatively full, I guess. Small jar, so it's not going to hold a great deal. But it'll give me an idea whether or not I like this. I can do more jars of it in the future. I picked just a few of the very small monastery beans that Southpaw Davy in Switzerland sent me. I'm going to add those to it. pretty close to being it. I'll use this tamping device a bit. Well, I guess I can get a bit more in. Yeah, I don't think I'll go with any more than that. And now the, the brine that you use is one teaspoon of non-iodized salt per cup of water. I've mixed up two cups here. I don't if I need that much, but uh, either a pickling salt, which is non-iodized, or kosher salt, which is also non-iodized. Use quite the two cups. And this, woo! Makes it a little bit too much of a good thing, I think. Too much liquid. I'll just dump some of that off and be right back here. Yeah, that's better. The pebble thing will keep it down below the liquid. Yeah. I've never used this exact contraption before, as you know from what I just said, but I do have some experience fermenting things, and I know it will dispel some liquid along with the gases when it gets working. 
So what I will do is uh, put it, it has to be in a dark place. It says for three to four weeks, which seems like a long period of time to me. I think it would be pretty cloudy if it went that long, but a couple of weeks, maybe close to three weeks anyway, and we'll see what it looks like. And I will do an update on a future video. But I will put it in a dark cupboard and put it in a bowl or on a plate or something to, to catch any of the liquid that comes out of it. But I think it looks quite pretty. Let's hope it tastes as nice as it looks. Well, thank you very much for watching.